section sixteen of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox the sorrows of ireland by john jerome rooney a m l l d the sorrows of ireland what a vision of woe the words conjure up the late goldwin smith himself an englishman and a unionist in his irish history and the irish question finds that of all histories the history of ireland is the saddest for nearly seven centuries it was a course of strife between races bloodshed massacre misgovernment civil war oppression and misery the first of the great scourges of erin was the coming of the danes the bloodthirsty and conquest-loving vikings of the north the worshippers of thor and odin the gods of thunder and of strife these warriors in never-ending invasions had for four hundred years overrun britain and finally conquered the northern provinces of gaul until the end of the eighth century ireland had been free from the scandinavian scourge about this time the invaders made lodgments along the coasts passed inward through the island burned and looted religious houses and schools of learning levied tribute upon the inhabitants and at length established themselves firmly at limerick waterford dublin wexford and carlingford fortified towns were built trading communications with britain and the continent were set up and the northmen though not in actual possession of the interior of the island was apparently in substantial control of its destinies brian baruma or baru brother of the king of munster of the dalcasian race of o'brien refused to submit roused his brother fought the danes of limerick at sulcoid a d nine hundred sixty eight and captured limerick brian later succeeded his brother became sovereign of all ireland a d one thousand one and on good friday a d one thousand fourteen joined battle with the danes upon the famous field of clontarf here the power of the northmen was forever broken brian falling at the moment of victory while in his tent by the hand of a fugitive dane with the death of brian the united government dissolved the provincial kings or princes resumed separate authority and a struggle arose among them with varying success for the national sovereignty the central government never had been strong as the nation was organized on a tribal or family basis in this weakened condition dermot mcmurrow king of leinster abducted the wife of o'rourke prince of Breffney, while the latter was on a pilgrimage mcmurrow was compelled to fly to england he sought the protection of the angevin english king henry plantagenet as a result of this appeal a small expedition headed by strongbow a d eleven sixty nine was sent to ireland and waterford wexford and dublin were taken then came henry himself in eleven seventy one with a fleet of two hundred forty ships four hundred knights and four thousand men landing at waterford this expedition was the beginning of the english attempted conquest of ireland a proceeding that through all the ruin and bloodshed of eight hundred years is not yet accomplished henry's first act was to introduce the feudal system into that southern half of the island which he controlled he seized great tracts of land which he in turn granted to his followers under feudal customs 
he introduced the offices of the english feudal system and the english laws and placed his followers in all the positions of power holding their lands and authority under the feudal conditions of rendering him homage and military service this was the root of the alien landlordism and foreign political control of future times which became the chief curses of ireland the prolific source of innumerable woes the succeeding years to the reign of henry the eighth witnessed the extension and at times the decline of the anglo-norman rule when henry the seventh became king of england the anglo-norman colony or pale had shrunk to two counties and a half around dublin defended by a ditch many of the original norman knights had become more irish than the irish themselves such was the great family of the geraldines or fitzgerald the most powerful with the o'neills of the north in ireland a united attack at this time would most certainly have driven out the invader for it must be remembered that dublin the pale the castle government of later times was the citadel of the english foreign power and before a united nation would most certainly have succumbed when henry the eighth ascended the throne of england the policy of peace in ireland was continued during the early portion of his reign then came henry's break with the pope over the royal divorce the irish beyond the pale and many within it were loyal to the church of their fathers to the faith of patrick the faith of the roman see to henry and his daughter elizabeth the daughter of anne boleyn who displaced henry's lawful wife this was treason henceforth to the bitterness of race hatred and the pride of the conqueror were to be added the blackest of religious feuds the most cruel of religious persecutions in the history of the world again let goldwin smith the english unionist describe the result of all the wars waged by a civilized on a barbarous seek and despised race these wars waged by the english on the irish seem to have been the most hideous no quarter was given by the invader to man woman or child the butchering of women and children is repeatedly and brutally avowed nothing can be more horrible than the cool satisfaction with which english commanders report their massacres famine was deliberately added to the other horrors what was called law was more cruel than war it was death without the opportunity for defence and with the hypocrisy of the forms of justice added out of this situation came the infamous penal code which by the period of william the third about sixteen hundred ninety two became a finished system this is the irish code of which lord brougham said it was so ingeniously contrived that an irish catholic could not lift his hand without breaking it and edmund burke said the wit of man never devised a machine to disgrace a realm or destroy a kingdom so perfect as this montesquieu the great french jurist philosopher the author of the epoch-making spirit of the laws commented it must have been contrived by devils it ought to have been written in blood and the only place to register it is in hell yet for two hundred years this code of death national and individual was the supreme law of ireland wendell phillips the great american orator in his lecture on daniel o'connell summed up this penal code in words that will not soon be forgotten by the world his reference to mr frode is to james anthony frode the english historian he says you know that under it an irish catholic could not sit in the house of commons he could not hold any commission from the crown either civil or military he could be a common soldier nothing more 
he could neither vote nor sit on a jury nor stand on a witness stand nor bring a suit nor be a doctor nor be a lawyer nor travel five miles from his own home without a permit from a justice of the peace the nearest approach that ever was made to him was a south carolina negro before the war he had no rights that a protestant needed to respect if he was a landholder if all his children were catholics he was obliged to divide the land equally between them this was the english plan for eliminating the catholic tenure of the land and letting it slip out of their hands then if any of the children during their father's life concluded to become protestants in such case they took the whole estate or indeed they might compel the father to put his estate in trust for their benefit so if the catholic wife would not go to an episcopalian church once a month which she deemed it a sin to do she forfeited her dower but if she went regularly she could have all the estate if a catholic had a lease and it rose one quarter in value any protestant could take it from him by bringing that fact to the notice of a justice of the peace three justices of the peace might summon any catholic before them and oblige him to give up his faith or quit the realm four justices could oblige him to abjure his faith or sell his estates if a protestant paid one dollar tax the catholic paid two if a protestant lost a ship when at war with the catholic power and at the time there was only one protestant power in europe besides great britain that was holland so that the chances were nine to one that in case of war great britain would be at war with the catholic power in such a case if a protestant lost a ship he went home and assessed the value on his catholic neighbors and was reimbursed so of education we fret a great deal on account of a class of irishmen who come to our shores and are lacking in education in culture and refinement but you must remember the bad laws you must remember the malignant legislation that sentenced them to a life of ignorance and made education a felony in catholic ireland if an irishman sent his child to a protestant schoolmaster all right but if a parent would not do so and sent him to a catholic school the father was fined ten pounds a week and the schoolmaster was fined five pounds a week and for the third offence he was hung but if the father determined that his child should be educated and sent him across the channel to france the boy forfeited his citizenship and became an alien and if discovered the father was fined one hundred pounds and anybody except the father who harboured him forfeited all civil rights that is he could not sue in a court of law nor could he vote indeed a catholic could not marry if he married a protestant the marriage was void the children were illegitimate and if one catholic married another it required the presence of a priest and if a priest landed in ireland for twenty minutes it was death to this ferocious code sir robert peel in our own day added the climax that no catholic should quit his dwelling between the hours of sunset and sunrise an exaggeration of the curfew law of william the conqueror now you will hardly believe that this was enacted as a law but mr froude alludes to this code yes he was very honest he would paint england as black as she deserved he said of queen elizabeth that she failed in her duty as a magistrate she failed towards ireland in her capability of being a great ruler and then he proceeded after passing sentence to give us the history of her reign and showed that in very many cases she could not have done any different for instance oh it is the saddest blackest most horrible statement of all history it makes you doubt the very possibility of human nature when you read that spencer the poet who had the most ardent most perfect ideas in english poetry spencer sat at the council board that ordered 
the wholesale butchery of a spanish regiment captured in ireland and to execute the order he chose sir walter raleigh the scholar the gentleman the poet the author and the most splendid englishman of his age and norris a captain under sydney in whose veins flowed the blood of sir philip writing home to elizabeth begs and persuades her to believe in o'neill's crimes and asks for leave to send a hired man to poison him and the virgin queen makes no objection mr froude quotes a letter from captain norris in which he states that he found himself in an island where five hundred irish all women and children not a man among them had taken refuge from the war and he deliberately butchered every living soul and queen elizabeth in a letter still extant answers by saying tell my good servant that i will not forget his good services he tells us that the english nobility and gentry would take a gun as unhesitatingly as a fowler and go out to shoot an irishman as an indian would a buffalo then he tells us with amazement that you never could make an irishman respect an englishman he points to some unhappy kildare the sole relic of a noble house whose four uncles were slaughtered in cold blood that is the only word for this kind of execution slaughtered and he left alone a boy grows up characterless and kills an archbishop every impetuous impatient act is dragged before the prejudiced mind but when mr froude is painting sir walter and spencer blind no longer he says i regret it is very sad to think that such things should ever have been such was the cup from which ireland drank even into the days of men now living nor was this all the rise of english manufactures brought a new chapter of woes to ireland the irish cattle trade had been killed by the act of charles the second for the benefit of english farmers the irish then took up the raising of wool and woollen manufactures a flourishing trade grew up an english law destroyed it in succession the same greed killed the cotton the glove-making the glass-making and the brewing trades these were reserved for the english maker and merchant these crimes upon irish industry surpassed a thousandfold the later english attempts upon the industries of the american colonies under the code and through the extreme poverty produced thereby substantially all the land of ireland passed out of the hands of the people they became mere serfs upon the soil their tribute was paid through a rapacious agent to a foreign landlord the improvement of the land by the labour of the tenant brought increase of rent there was no fixity of tenure of the land it was held at the will of the agent reflecting the rapacity of the non-resident landlord upon these holdings the principal crop was the potato a failure of this crop was a failure to pay rent eviction on the roadside and starvation the results after the enactment of the penal code and during the greater part of the eighteenth century are thus described by goldwin smith on such a scene of misery as the abodes of the irish cotters the sun has rarely looked down their homes were the most miserable hovels chimneyless filthy of decent clothing they were destitute their food was the potato sometimes they bled their cattle and mixed the blood with sorrel the old and sick were everywhere dying by cold and hunger and rotting amidst filth and vermin when the potato failed as it often did came famine with disease in its train want and misery were in every face the roads were spread with dead and dying there was sometimes none to bear the dead to the grave and they were buried in the fields and ditches where they perished fluxes and malignant fevers followed laying these villages waste i have seen says a contemporaneous witness 
the labourer endeavouring to work at his spade but fainting for want of food and forced to quit it i have seen the helpless orphan exposed on the dunghill and none to take him in for fear of infection and i have seen the hungry infant sucking at the breast of the already expired parent all these are not only the horrors of a hundred or two hundred years ago they were repeated in ten thousand forms in the awful famine days of eighteen hundred forty seven in eighteen forty one the population of ireland was eight million seven hundred ninety six thousand five hundred forty five persons in eighteen hundred fifty one after four years of famine the population was six million five hundred fifty one thousand nine hundred seventy leaving two million two hundred forty four thousand five hundred seventy five persons to be accounted for and taking no account of the natural increase of the population during the ten years not less than a million and a half of these died of starvation and the fevers brought on by famine the remainder emigrated to foreign lands in this account of the sorrows of ireland nothing has been said of the vast emigrations thousands upon thousands of persons in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries leaving ireland under forced deportations in a practical selling into slavery the sum total of this loss to ireland cannot be less than five million souls the earlier deportations were carried out under the most atrocious circumstances families were broken up and scattered to distant and separate colonies such as barbados the new england states and later to the south pacific this is but a glance at some of the wrongs to ireland's religious intellectual and material welfare wrongs that have plunged her into an age-long poverty but one of the greatest of all her sorrows has been the denial of her national life the attempt to strangle her rightful aspirations as a free people her autonomy was taken from her her smallest legislative act was the act of a stranger in fine every mark of political slavery was put upon her a foreign soldiery was and still is quartered upon her soil the control of her revenues of the system of taxation was wrested from her these became the function of a hateful resident oligarchy alien in everything to the irish people and of the english parliament to which she was not admitted until the days of daniel o'connell and then she was admitted only through fear of revolution the dawn has come the dark night is almost past the heroic struggle of ireland is about to close in triumph her loyalty to her ideals of freedom and religion is to meet its reward the epitaph of robert emmet will soon be written for at last ireland is certain of taking her place among the nations of the earth references dalton history of ireland j p prendergast cromwellian settlement barrington rise and fall of the irish nation mcnevin confiscation of ulster r r madden history of the penal laws murphy cromwell in ireland t a emmet ireland under english rule two volumes mrs j r green irish nationality walpole a short history of the kingdom of ireland a m sullivan story of ireland thomas moore history of ireland edmund spencer view of the state of ireland c gavin duffy four years of irish history eighteen forty five to forty nine isaac butt land tenure in ireland justin mccarthy history of our own times johnston and spencer ireland's story 
mcgogan's history of ireland and its continuation by john mitchell william sampson memoirs of an irish exile eighteen hundred thirty two john curry a historical and critical review of the civil wars in ireland seventeen hundred seventy five john boyle the battlefields of ireland eighteen hundred seventy nine speeches of edmund burke daniel o'connell henry grattan wendell phillips speech on daniel o'connell father tom burke lectures on ireland End of section 16section 17 of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox section 17 irish leaders by shane leslie irish leaders have proved far famed but not long lived their short and strenuous careers have burnt out in their prime, and their ends have been such as attend conflagrations. More often they have left a pall than a light in the heavens, for the most brilliant lives in Irish history have led to the most tragic deaths. The destiny which allotted them impossible tasks has given them immortality on the scenes of their glorious failure. They differ from leaders of other countries, who divide the average pittances of success or ill-success on the road to honoured retirement. Few of the heroes among modern nations have left such vivid and lasting memory as the strong men of Ireland. During the nineteenth century their lore and cult have traversed the whole world in the wake of the great emigrations. Whether they failed or succeeded in wresting the independence and ideals of Ireland for a while from the fell clutch of circumstance, they live with their race forever. Under Plantagenet and Tudor rule, the Irish leaders presented a sullen but armed resistance. A never-completed invasion was met by sporadic raids and successive risings. A race of military outlaws was fashioned, which accounts for much in Irish character today. Previously, the Irish, like all Celtic civilization, was founded on the arts, on speech, and on law, rather than on war and feudalism. Even Irish militancy was crushed in the Williamite Wars, and the race, deprived of its original subsistence, as well as of its acquired defense, sank into the stupor of penal times. Those who should have been leaders of Ireland became marshals of Austria and France. Gradually it was learnt that the pen is mightier than the sword, and the human voice more potent than the sound of cannon, and the constitutional struggle developed, not without relapse and reverse. To Dean Swift must be attributed the change in the national weapon, and the initiation of a leadership of resistance within the law, which has lasted into modern times. Accident made Swift an Irishman and a chance attempt to circulate debased coins in Ireland for the benefit of a debased but royal favourite made him a patriot. Swift drove out Wood's halfpence at the pen point. He shamed the government, he checked the all-powerful Walpole, and he roused the manhood of Ireland towards independence and legislation. He never realised what a position history would give him. To himself he seemed a gloomy failure, to his contemporaries a popular pamphleteer, but to posterity he is the creator of public conscience in Ireland. He was the father of patriotic journalism, and the first to defend Ireland's rights through literature. Though his popularity was quenched in lunacy, his impress upon Irish politics remains as powerful and lasting as upon English literature. Within the so-called Irish Parliament, sprang forth the first of a long line of orators, Henry Flood. He was the first to study the Constitution for purposes of opposition. He attacked viceregal government in its own audit house. Pension and corruption he laid bare, and upon the people he breathed a spirit of independence. Unfortunately, he was not content with personal prominence. He accepted office, hoping thereby to benefit Ireland. 
his voice became lost to the higher cause, and another man rose in his stead, Henry Grattan. The American War tested the rival champions of liberty. Flood favored sending Irish troops, armed negotiators, he called them, to deal with the revolted colonists. Grattan nobly reviled him for standing, quote, with a metaphor in his mouth and a bribe in his pocket, a champion against the rights of America, the only hope of Ireland and the only refuge of the liberties of mankind. Flood collapsed under his ignoble honors. He was not restored by returning to patriotic opposition. Grattan's leadership proved permanent politically and historically. His name connotes the high watermark of Irish statesmanship. The parliament which he created, and whose rights he defined, became a standard, and his name a talisman and a challenge to succeeding generations. The comparative oratory of Grattan and Flood is still debated. Both, after a manner, were unique and unsurpassed. Flood possessed staying power in sheer invective and sustained reasoning. Grattan was fluent in epigram, and most inspiring when condensed, and he had an immense moral advantage. The Parliament, which made him a grant, was independent, but it was from one of subservience that Flood drew his salary. Henceforth, Grattan was haunted by the jealous and discredited herald of himself. A great genius, Flood lacked the keen judgment and careless magnanimity without which leadership in Ireland brings misunderstanding and disaster. In the English house, he achieved total failure. Grattan followed him after the Union, but retained the attention, if not the power, of Dublin days. Neither influenced English affairs, and their eloquence, curiously, was considered cold and sententious. Their rhapsody appeared artificial, and their exposition labored. The failure of these men was no stigma. What is called Irish oratory arose with the inclusion of the Celtic understrata in politics. Burke's speeches were delivered to an empty house. Though he lived out of Ireland and never became an Irish leader in Ireland, Burke had an influence in England greater than that of any Irishman before or since. The beauty and diction of his speech fostered future parliamentary speaking. Macaulay, Gladstone, Peel, and Brougham were suckled on him. His farthest reaching achievement was his treatment of the French Revolution. His single voice rolled back that storm in Europe. But no words could retard revolution in Ireland herself. Venal government made the noblest conservative thinking seem treason to the highest interests of the country. The temporary success of Grattan's parliament had been largely won by the volunteers. They had been drilled, ostensibly against foreign invasion, but virtually to secure reforms at home. Their power became one with which England had to reckon, and which she never forgave. Lord Charlemont, their president, was an estimable country gentleman, but not a national leader. A more dashing figure appeared in the singular Earl of Bristol. Though an Irish bishop and an English peer, he set himself in the front rank of the movement, assuming, with general consent, the demeanour and trappings of royalty. He would not have hesitated to plunge Ireland into war had he obtained Charlemont's position, but it was not so fated. After forcing parliamentary independence, the volunteers meekly disbanded, and the United Irishmen took their place. The brilliancy of Grattan's parliament never fulfilled national aspirations. Bristol was succeeded by another recruit from the aristocracy, Lord Edward Fitzgerald. With Wolfe Tone and Robert Emmett, he has become legendary. All three attained popular canonization, for all three sealed their brief leadership with death. Lord Edward was a dreamer, an Irish Bayard, too chivalrous to conspire successfully, and too frankly courageous to match a government of guile. Tone was far more dangerous. He realized that foreign invasion was necessary to successful rebellion, and he allowed no scruple or obstacle in his path. He washed his hands of law and politics entirely. To divert Napoleon to Ireland was his object, and the total separation of Ireland his ambition. 
the united irishmen favored the invasion which the volunteers had been formed to repel the feud between moral and physical force broke out the failure of the sterner policy in 1798 did not daunt Emmett from his ill-starred attempt in 1803. He combined Lord Edward's chivalry with some abilities worthy of tone, but he failed. The failure he redeemed by a swan song from the dock and a demeanor on the scaffold, which have become part of Irish tradition. After the Union, Irish leaders sprang up in the English house, which Pitt had unwittingly made the cockpit of the racial struggle. Far from absorbing the Irish element, the commons found themselves forced to resist, rally, and finally succumb. The Irish house cannot be dismissed without mention of Curran. He was a brilliant enemy of corruption and servility. O'Connell said, quote, there was never so honest an Irishman, end quote, which may account for his greater success as a lawyer than a politician. To be an Irish leader and a successful lawyer is given to no man. For the former, the sacrifice of a great career is needed. This sacrifice, Daniel O'Connell was prepared to make. His place in history will never be estimated, for few have been so loved or hated, or for stronger reasons. Never did a tribune, rising to power, lift his people to such sudden hope and success. Never did a champion leave his followers at his death and decline to more terrible despair. Friend and foe admit his immensity. He was the greatest Irishman that ever lived, or seemingly could live. In his own person, he contained the whole genius of the Celt. Ireland could not hold his emotions, which overflowed into the world for expression. He rose on a crest of religious agitation, but emancipation won. He had the foresight to associate the Irish cause with the advent of reform and liberalism throughout Europe. He sounded the notes of free trade and anti-slavery. What he said in Parliament one day, Ireland re-echoed the next. To her he was all in all, her hero and her prophet, her messiah and her strong deliverer. On the continent he roughly personified Christian democracy. In public oratory, O'Connell introduced a new style. Torrential and overwhelming, as Flood and Grattan had never been, he proved more successful, if less polished. The exaggerations of Gaelic speech found outburst in his English. Peel's smile was the silver plate on a coffin, Wellington a stunted corporal, and Israeli the lineal descendant of the impenitent thief. It sounds bombastic, but in those feudal forties it rang more magnificent than war. Single-voiced, he overawed the host of bigots, dullards, and reactionaries. Unhappily, he let his people abandon their native tongue, while teaching them how to balance the rival parties in England, the latter a policy that has proved Ireland's fortune since. He loosed the spirit of sectarianism in the tithe war, and he crushed the Young Ireland movement, which bred Fenianism in its death agony. But he made the Catholic a citizen. Results stupendous as far-reaching sprang from his steps every way. The finest pen sketch of O'Connell is by Mitchell, who says, quote, Besides superhuman and subterhuman passions, yet withal a boundless fund of masterly affectation and consummate histrionism, hating and loving heartily, outrageous in his merriment and passionate in his lamentation, he had the power to make other men hate or love, laugh or weep, at his good pleasure. End quote. Yet during his lifetime there lived others worthy of national leadership. O'Brien, Duffy, and Davis played their part in England as well as in Ireland. Father Matthew founded the Temperance as Fergus O'Connor the Chartist movement. And there was an orator who fascinated Gladstone, Scheele. Father Matthew succeeded in keeping many millions of men sober during the forties until the Great Famine engulfed his work as it did O'Connell's. To him is due as a feature of Irish life, the brass band with banners, which he originally organized as a counter-intoxicant. Fergus O'Connor founded radical socialism in England. As the Lion of Freedom, he enjoyed a popularity with English workmen approaching that of O'Connell in Ireland. 
he ended in lunacy but he had the credit of forwarding peasant proprietorship far in advance of his times Scheele was a tragic orator an iambic rhapsodist o'connell called him who might have been leader did not a greater tragedian occupy the stage and Scheele was content to be o'connell's organizer without o'connell's voice or presence he was his rhetorical superior excelling in irony and the byplays of speech for which o'connell was too exuberant Scheele's speeches touch exquisite though not the deep notes of o'connell whom he criticized for quote, throwing out broods of sturdy young ideas upon the world without a rag to cover them end quote. he discredited his master and his cause by taking office the fruits of emancipation were tempting to those who had borne the heat of the day but there was a rising school of patriots who refused acquiescence to anything less than total freedom the young irelanders reincarnated the men of ninety-eight they were neither too late nor too soon they snatched the sacred torch of liberty from the dying hands of o'connell who summoned in vain old ireland against his young rivals but men like davis and duffy appealed to types o'connell never swayed he could carry the mob but poet journalist and idealist were enrolled with young ireland for this reason the history of their failure is brighter in literature than the tale of O'Connell's triumphs. To read Duffy's Young Ireland and Mitchell's Jail Journal, with drafts from the spirit of the nation, is to relive the period. Without the Young Irelanders, Irish nationalism might not have survived the famine. Mitchell, as open advocate of physical force, became father to Fenianism. An honest conspirator and brilliant writer, he proved that the pen of journalism was sharper than the Irish pike. Carlyle described him as, quote, a fine, elastic-spirited young fellow, whom I grieve to see rushing on destruction palpable by attack of windmills, end quote. Destruction came surely, but coupled with immortality. He was transported as a felon before the insurrection, while his writings sprang up in angry but unarmed men. Mitchell and O'Connell both sought the liberation of Ireland, but their viewpoint differed. Mitchell thought only of liberty. O'Connell, not unnaturally, considered the liberator. His refusal to allow a drop of blood to be shed caused young Ireland to secede. Only when death removed his influence could the pent-up feelings of the country break out under Smith O'Brien. If Mitchell was an Irish Robespierre, O'Brien was their Lafayette. His advance from the level of dead aristocracy had been rapid, from defending Whigs in Parliament, he passed to opposition and contempt of the House. He resigned from the bench from which O'Connell had been dismissed, became a repealer, adding the words, no compromise, and finally gloried in his treason before the House. His next step brought a price upon his head. Grave and frigid, but inwardly warm-hearted and passionate, O'Brien had little aptitude for rebellion but the death penalty, commuted to transportation which he incurred, went far to redeem his forlorn failure. Mitchell, who shared his Australian imprisonment, left a fine picture of, quote, this noblest of Irishmen, thrust in among the off-scourings of England's jails, with his home desolated and his hopes ruined, and defeated life falling into the sear and yellow leaf, a man who cannot be crushed or bowed or broken, anchored immovably upon his own brave heart within his clear eye and soul open as ever to all the melodies and splendors of heaven and earth and calmly waiting for the angel death End quote. the irish cause was not revived until the fenian movement disgust with the politicians drove the noblest into their ranks in stevens they found an organizing chief in boyle o'reilly a poet and in John O'Leary, a political thinker, men who, under other conditions, had achieved mundane success. The Fenians were defended by Isaac Butt, a big-hearted, broad-minded lawyer, who afterwards organized a party to convince Englishmen that repeal was innocuous when called home rule. The people stood his patient ways patiently, but when a more desperate leader arrived, they transferred allegiance, 
and but died of a broken heart. Parnell took his place and began to marshal the broken forces of Irish democracy against his own class. But had been a polite parliamentarian, reverencing the courtesy of debate, and at heart loving the British Constitution. Parnell felt that his mission lay in breaking rather than interpreting the law. The well-bred house stared and protested when he defied their chosen six hundred. Parnell faced them with their own marble callousness. He outdid them in political cynicism, and outbowed them in frigid courtesy while maintaining a policy before which tradition melted and a time-honored system collapsed. In one stormy decade, he tore the cloak from the mother of parliaments, reducing her to a plain-speaking democratic machine. Through the breach he made, the English Labour Party has since entered. He united priest and peasant, physical and moral force, under him, he could lay Ireland under storm or lull at his pleasure. His achievement equaled his self-confidence. He reversed the Irish land system and threw English politics out of gear. With the balance of power in his hand, he made Tory and Radical outbid each other for his support. He was no organizer or orator, but he fascinated able men to conduct his schemes as Napoleon used his marshals. On a pregnant day, he equaled the achievement of St. Paul and converted Gladstone, who had once been his jailer. Gladstone became a home ruler, and henceforth English politics knew no peace. Parnell stood for the fall and rise of many. Under his banner, Irish peasants became human beings with human rights. He felled the feudal class in Ireland and undermined them in England incalculable forces were set to destroy him a forged letter in the times classed him with assassins while a legal commission was sent to try his whole movement it is history that his triumphant vindication was followed by a greater fall the happiness of ireland was sucked into the maelstrom of his ruin he refused to retire from leadership at gladstone's bidding and Ireland staggered into civil war. The end is known. Parnell died as he lived. Of his moral fault, there is no palliation, but it may be said he held his country's honor dearer than his own, for he could not bear to see her win even independence by obeying the word of an Englishman. References Lecky, Leaders of Irish Opinion Mitchell, Jail Journal Duffy, Young Ireland, O'Brien, Life of Parnell, Dalton, History of Ireland. End of section 17. Recording by Owen Cook in Pottawatomie, Ceded Land. Section 18 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Adamson The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox, Section 18 Irish Heroines by Alice Milligan The worth and glory of a nation may well be measured and adjudged by the typical character of its womanhood. Not so much, I would say, by the eminence attained to by the rarely gifted, exceptionally developed individuals, as by the prevalence of noble types at every period, and amongst all classes of the community, and by their recurrence from age to age under varying circumstances of national fortune. Judged by such a standard, Ireland emerges triumphant and points to the role of her chequered history, the story of her ancient race, with confidence and pride. Gaze into the furthest vistas of her legendary past, into the remotest eras of which tradition preserves a misty memory, and the figure of some fair, noble woman stands forth, glimmering like a white statue against the gloom. At every period of stern endeavour, through all the generations of recorded time, the pages of her annals are inscribed with the names of mothers, sisters, wives, not unworthy to stand there beside those of the world-renowned heroes of the Gael. In the ancient tales of Ireland we read of great female physicians and distinguished female lawyers and judges. 
There were banfilla, or women poets, who, like the filla, were at the same time soothsayers and poetesses, and there are other evidences of the high esteem in which women were held. There can be no doubt, to judge by the elaborate descriptions of garments in the saga texts, that the women were very skilful in weaving and needlework. The Irish peasant girls of today inherit from them not a little of their gift for lace-making and linen embroidery. Ladies of the highest rank practiced needlework as an accomplishment and a recreation. Some of the scissors and shears they used have come to light in excavations. In the stories of the loves of the ancient Irish, whether immortals or mortals, the woman's role is the more accentuated, while in Teutonic tradition man plays the chief part. Again, it has often been remarked that the feminine interest is absent from the earlier heroic forms of some literatures. Not so, however, in the earliest saga texts of the Irish. Many are the famous women to whom the old tales introduce us and who stand out and compel attention like the characters of the Greek drama. Everyone knows of the faithful Deirdre, the heroine of the touching story of the exile of the sons of Osnoch and of her death, of the proud and selfish Maeve, the ambitious queen of Connacht, the most warlike and most expert in the use of weapons of the women of the Gael, far superior in combat and counsel to her husband, Eilil, of Emer, the faithful wife of Cuchulain, of Etin of the Horses, that was her name in Fairyland, and of many others too numerous to mention. It is with the introduction of Christianity into Ireland that the Irish woman came into her rightful place and attained the preponderating influence which she, ever since, has held among the Celtic people. In the period which followed the evangelization of the island, many were the women of worth who upheld the honour and glory of Inishfall the Fair, and women were neither the less numerous nor the less ardent who hung upon the lips of the Apostle of Ireland. Amid the galaxy of the saints, how lustrous, how divinely fair shines the star of Bridget, the shepherd maiden of Focard, the disciple of Patrick the Apostle, the guardian of the holy light that burned beneath the oak trees of Kildare. Over all Ireland and through the Hebridean Isles, she is renowned above any other. We think of her, moreover, not alone, but as the centre of a great company of cloistered maidens, the refuge and helper of the sinful and sorrowful, who found in the gospel that Patrick preached a message of consolation and deliverance. Let it be remembered that the shroud of Patrick is deemed to have been woven by Bridget's hand, that when she died in 525, Column Kill, the future apostle of Scotland, was a child of four. So she stands midmost of that trilogy of saints whose dust is said to rest in down. Who that hears of Column Kill will forget how he won that name, Dove of the Church, because of his early piety, and that surely bespeaks a mother's guiding care. Ethne, mother of Column Kill, remains a vague but picturesque figure, seen against the background of the rugged heath-clad hills of Tyrconnell by the bright blue waters of Garton's Triple Lake. Her hearthstone or couch is shown there to this day, where, once in slumber, before the birth of her son, she saw in a glorious visionary dream a symbol of his future greatness. A vast veil woven of sunshine and flowers seemed to float down upon her from heaven, an exquisitely poetic thought which gives us warrant to believe that Columkill's poetic skill was inherited from his mother. Ronnet, the mother of his biographer St. Adam Nunn, plays a more notable part in history. For, according to an ancient Gaelic text recently published, it was to her that the women of Ireland owed the royal decree which liberated them from military service. The story goes that once, as she walked beside the Boyne, after some sanguinary conflict, she came upon the bodies of two women who had fallen in battle. One grasped a reaping hook, the other a sword, and dreadful wounds disfigured them. Horrified at the sight, she brought strong pressure to bear upon her son and his influence in the councils of the land availed to bring about the promulgation of the decree which freed women from war service. Our warrior kings had noble queens to rule their households, and of these none stands out so distinctly after long lapse of time as Gormley, the daughter of Flan Shunna, and wife of Neil Glondov. Her story has in it that element of romance which touches the heart and wins the sympathy of all who hear it. Her father was king of the Mahan branch of the Clan Neil and Ardry of Ireland for 37 years. Neil Glondov was king of Tyrone and heir of Flan in the high kingship, for at that era it was the custom for the kings of Meath and of Tyrone to hold the supreme power alternately. In order to knit north and south, Flan betrothed his beautiful daughter to Cormac Macquillanan, king of Cashel, 
an ideal husband, one would have thought, for a poetess like Gormley, for Cormac was the foremost scholar of the day. But his mind was so set on learning and religion that he took holy orders and became Bishop King of Cashel, repudiating his destined bride. Gormley was then given as wife to Ciarvel, King of Leinster, and war was waged against Cormac, who was killed in the Battle of Ballymoon. Coming home wounded, Ciarvel lay on his couch, and while tended by Gormley and her ladies, told the story of the battle, and boasted of having insulted the dead body of King Cormac. Gormley reproached him for his ignoble conduct in such terms that his anger and jealousy flamed up, and striking her with his fist he hurled her to the ground. Gormley rose indignant and left his house forever, returning to the palace of King Flan, and on Carvel's death she at last found a true lover and worthy mate in Neil Dondov, who brought her northward to rule over the famous palace of Eilach. In 916 Neil became High King, but the place of honour was also the place of danger, and soon he led the mustered hosts of the north against the pagan foreigners who held Dublin and Fingal, and he fell in battle at Rathfarnham. A poem, preserved for us ever since, tells us that Gormley was present at his burial and chanted a funeral ode. Her long widowhood was a period of disconsolate mourning. At length it is said she had a dream or vision in which King Neil appeared to her in such lifelike shape that she spread her arms to embrace him, and thus wounded her breast against the carven headpost of her couch and of that wound she died. Many saintly, many noble, many hospitable and learned women lightened the darkness that fell over Ireland after the coming of the Normans. I passed to the time when a sovereign lady filled the throne of England, the spacious days of great Elizabeth, which were also the period of Ireland's greatest, sternest struggle against a policy of extermination towards her nobles and suppression of her ancient faith. Amid all the heroes and leaders of that wondrous age in Ireland, there appears, like a reincarnation of legendary Maeve, a warlike queen in Connacht, Grace O'Malley, Granula of the Ballads. Instead of a chariot, she mounts to the prow of a swift sailing galley and sweeps over the wild Atlantic billows from isle to isle, from coast to coast, taking tribute, or is it plunder, from the clans. First an O'Flaherty is her husband, then a Norman Burke. In Clare Island they show her the castle tower with a hole in the wall, through which they say she tied a cable from her ship, ready by day or night for a summons from her seamen. She voyaged as far as London town and stood face to face with the roughed and hooped Elizabeth, meeting her offer of an English title with the assertion that she was a princess in her own land. The mother of Red Hugh O'Donnell, Inneen Dove, though daughter of the Scottish Lord of the Isles, was none the less of the old Irish stock. Her character is finely sketched for us by the Franciscan chronicler who wrote the story of the captivity and mighty deeds of her son. When the clans of Tyrconnell assembled to elect the youthful chieftain, he writes, It was an advantage that she came to the gathering, for she was the head of the advice and counsel of the Kinel Connell, and though she was slow and deliberate and much praised for her womanly qualities, she had the heart of a hero and the soul of a soldier. Her daughter, Nuala, is the woman of the piercing wail in Mangan's translation of the Bard's Lament for the death of the Ulster chieftains in Rome. Modern critics like to interpret the Dark Rosaline poem as an expression of Red Hugh's devotion to Ireland, but I think that Rose, O'Doherty's daughter, wife of the peerless Owen Roe, deserves recognition as she whose wholly delicate white hands should girdle him with steel. The record has come down to us that she prompted and encouraged her husband to return from the Low Countries and a position of dignity in a foreign court to command the war in Ireland, and in her first letter, ere she followed him over sea, she asked eagerly, How stands Tyrconnell? True daughter of Ulster was Owen's wife, so let us henceforth acknowledge her as the Roisin Dove, Dark Rosaline of the sublimest of all patriot songs. In the Cromwellian and Williamite wars, we see the mournful mothers and daughters of the Gaeldom passing in sad processions to Connacht, or wailing on Shannon banks for the flight of the wild geese. But what of Limerick Wall? What of the valorous rush of the women of the beleaguered city to stem the inroads of the besiegers and rally the defenders to the breach? The decree of St. Adam Nunn was quite forgotten then, and when manly courage for a moment was daunted, woman's fortitude replaced and re-inspired it and fortitude was sorely needed through the black years that followed, the penal days, when Ireland, crushed in the dust, bereft of arms, achieved a sublimer victory than did even King Brian himself, champion of the cross, against the last muster of European heathendom. Yes, her women have done their share in making Ireland what she is, a heroic land, 
unconquered by long centuries of wrath and wrong a land that has not abandoned its faith through stress of direst persecution or bartered it for the lure of worldly dominion no nor ever yielded to despair in face of repeated national disaster it was this fidelity to principle on the part of the irish catholic people which won for them the alliance of all that were worthiest among the protestants of north and south in the days of the volunteers and the united irishmen what interesting and pathetic portraits of irish women are added to our role at this period none is more tenderly mournful than that of sarah curran the beloved of robert emmet the graceful prose of washington irving the poignant verses of moore have enshrined the memory of her weeping for him in the shadow of the scaffold dying of heartbreak at last in a far-off land no more need be said of her for whom the pity of the whole world has been awakened by song allied to sweetest saddest music what of anne devlin emmet's faithful servant helping in his preparations for insurrection aiding his flight shielding him in hiding even when tortured scourged half hanged by a brutal soldiery with stern-shut lips refusing to utter a word to compromise her master robert what of the sister of henry joy mccracken mary the friend and fellow-worker with the belfast united irishmen an independent self-reliant businesswoman she earned the money which she gave so liberally in the good cause or to help the poor and distressed through the whole period of a long life some still living have seen mary passing along the streets of belfast an aged woman clad in sombre gown to whom catholic artisans raised their caps reverently remembering how in ninety eight she had walked hand in hand with her brother to the steps of the scaffold and how in eighteen o three she had aided thomas russell in his escape from the north after emmet's failure had bribed his captors after arrest provided for his defence and preserved for futurity a record of his dying words madden's history of the united irishmen as far as it tells of the north is mainly the record that she kept as a sacred trust in letters papers long treasured memories of the men who fought and died to make ireland a united nation and now a scene in america comes last to my mind wolf tone a political fugitive who has served ireland well and come through danger to safety is busy laying the foundations of a happy and prosperous future with the beloved wife and sister and young children to brighten his home an estate near princeton new jersey has been all but bought possibilities of a career in the new republic open before him when a letter comes from belfast asking him to return to the post of danger to undertake a mission to france for the sake of ireland let his own pen describe what happens i handed the letter to my wife and sister and desired their opinion my wife especially whose courage and whose zeal for my honour and interests were not in the least abated by all her past sufferings supplicated me to let no consideration of her or our children stand for a moment in the way of my duty to our country adding that she would answer for our family during my absence and that the same providence which had so often as it were miraculously preserved us would not desert us now inspired by the fortitude of this noble woman tone went forth on his perilous mission and similarly the young ireland leaders mitchell and smith o'brien were sustained by the courage of their nearest and dearest eva the poetess of the nation gave her troth plight to one who had prison and exile to face ere he could claim her hand other names recur to me speranza with her lyric fire ellen o'leary fervent and still patient and wise fanny parnell and her sister and what of the women of ireland to-day shall they come short of the high ideal of the past falter and fail if devotion and sacrifice are required of them never whilst they keep in memory and honour the illustrious ones of whom i have written the name of irish woman to-day stands for steadfast virtue for hospitality for simple piety for cheerful endurance and in a changing world let us trust it is the will of god that in this there will be no change references on etna mother of st columkill the visions miracles and prophecies of st columba clarendon press series on Ronnet, S. Mackenvard, Life, in Irish, of Adam Non, Letter Kenny. Reeves, St. Adam Non's Life of St. Columba, The Mother of St. Adam Non, an Old Gaelic Text, ed by Kuno Meyer, Berlin. On Gormley, Thomas Concanon, Gormla, in Irish, The Gaelic League, Dublin. On Granula, Elizabethan State Papers, Record Office Series. William O'Brien, A Queen of Men. On Inneen Dove, O'Cleary's Life of Red Hugh, Contemporary. Ed by Dennis Murphy, 
S.J., Dublin, 1894. Standish O'Grady, The Flight of the Eagle, or Red Hugh's Captivity. On Rose, Wife of Owen Roe O'Neill, see references in Father Meehan's The Flight of the Earls, and in Sir John Gilbert's History of the Confederate War, Dublin, 1885. On The Wife of Wolf Tone, see Wolf Tone's Autobiography, ed by R. Barry O'Brien, London, 1894. The American edition has a fuller account of Tone's wife, her courage and devotion in educating her son, and her interviews with Napoleon, and life in America. The women of the United Irish period are fully dealt with in K. R. Madden's Lives and Times of the United Irishmen. On Mary McCracken, see Mrs. Milligan Fox, The Annals of the Irish Harpers. On the women of the Young Ireland period, see C. Gavin Duffy's Young Ireland, Dublin, and John O'Leary's Fenians and Fenianism. On the women of Limerick, see Reverend James Dowd, Limerick and its Sieges, Limerick, 1890. For the women under Cromwellian plantation persecutions and the penal laws, see Prendergast's Cromwellian Settlement, Reverend Dennis Murphy's Cromwell in Ireland, and R. R. Madden's History of the Penal Laws. End of section 18. Recording by Jenny Adamson. Section 19 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James McAndrew, San Francisco, California. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Irish Nationality. Irish Nationality by Lord Ashbourne. Note. This chapter was written by Lord Ashbourne in French, because he is so strong an Irishman that he objects to write it in English. This translation has been made by the editors. To those of us who are interested in the future of our country, there is at this very moment presented a really serious problem. The political struggle of the last century has been so intense that many of our people have come to have none but a political solution in view. For them, the whole question is one of politics, and they will continue to believe that Ireland will have found salvation the moment we get home rule or something like it. Such an attitude seems natural enough when we remember what our people have suffered in the past. Nevertheless, on a little reflection this error, for error it is, and an enormous one too, will be quickly dissipated. In the first place, the political struggle of today is only the continuation of a conflict which has lasted 700 years. And in point of fact, we have a right to be proud that after so many trials there still remains to us anything of our national inheritance. We find ourselves indeed on the battlefield, somewhat seriously bruised, but we can console ourselves with the thought that our opponent is in equally doleful case, that he is beginning to suffer from a fatal weariness and that he is anxious to make peace with us. In order to place the present political situation in its true light and to take into account its comparatively limited importance, we must not lose sight of the fundamental fact that what home rule connotes is rather a tender of peace on the part of Ireland than a gift which England presents us of her own free will. In fact, our neighbor across the channel has as much interest as ourselves and perhaps even more in bringing the struggle to an end. Through us, England has already lost much prestige, and that famous British constitution, which in times past everyone admired, while trying in vain to imitate it, has lost caste considerably. I am not now speaking of the danger which an Ireland discontented and even hostile, and having nothing to lose, would constitute for England in case of war. It is especially from our neighbor's point of view that we can cry up home rule or any other solution that will bring peace. But let us leave to Great Britain the task of getting out of trouble as best she may. On our side, what shall we say of it? In our conflict with the English, we are not wearied. Rather, are we hardened for the fray. We have acquired the habit of fighting, and many of us can now scarcely regulate our conduct in a manner suitable to a state of peace with England. Nevertheless, as I have already said, we have not emerged unscathed from this war of the centuries. National sentiment, 
remains with us, no doubt, and our traditions are not wholly lost, especially among the country people of the West. But our commerce is almost ruined, and the national language is no longer spoken throughout the greater part of the country. It is true that a continuation of the hitherto existing state of war cannot do us much harm, that for purposes of mere destruction, all the advantages are on our side, and that on the other hand, we can begin a reconstruction at home without waiting for a treaty of peace to be signed. But we have some things to do for which a home government would be useful to us, and further, in the absence of such a government, it would be difficult to imagine what means could be employed to turn the people away from their too exclusive absorption in Anglo-Irish politics. It is then, from a practical point of view, that we wish for peace. But we may lawfully ask, will not this peace bring with it a special danger against which we ought to take precautions? As a matter of fact, there is such a danger, and it lies in the fact that the people have been to so great an extent obsessed by the political struggle that they run the risk, once their end is attained, of collapsing and of losing interest in the national question. Let us not forget that the question is to save our language and our civilization. Without it, it is all over for our nationality. Let us endeavor to turn our parliament to account in order to work seriously on the reconstruction of our national life, and it is certain that Ireland will find therein her salvation. We can therefore take advantage either of England's prolonged resistance or of peace. If England decides to continue the contest, she will suffer more from it than we. Her empire, her institutions, her safety will be more and more impaired. While, as for us, there will result a strong growth in patriotism and an anti-British bitterness. What we have to do right now is to take our bearings in such a way that no matter what happens to England, our own future shall be assured. We can do it if we wish it. The question is... Shall we wish it? Here it may be objected. Qui bono? The English language is quite enough for us. We have it now and we speak it, sometimes even better than the English people themselves. We are proud of using the same language as Sheridan, Burke and Grattan used. Such an opinion has its modicum of truth, though less now than a hundred years ago. Formerly, there was in Ireland, and especially around Dublin, a little colony of Anglo-Irish, the members of this colony spoke a very pure and classic English, and this fact is largely responsible for the place which Ireland at one time held in English literature. But during the last century, the remains of this colony have been swamped beneath a flood of half anglicized people, of Irishmen from the country districts, who were formerly excluded and who brought with them such a mixture of expressions and of phonetic tendencies derived from the Gaelic that the language of Grattan, Sheridan and Burke has well nigh gone out of existence. The reason of this is that since the date of Catholic emancipation, most careers are open to everybody. The result has been that the newly enfranchised majority has ultimately absorbed the minority and that the atmosphere of culture of which we have just spoken has disappeared. We thus reach an island which in a sense has neither culture nor language a country in which the Gaelic spoken by a people humiliated and deeply demoralized by an anti-Catholic legislation, which was both savage and degrading, tended to coalesce with an English already condemned to death. It is from the moment when the Catholics had finally triumphed over persecution that we must date the beginning of that political struggle with which we are familiar, a struggle which has resulted in absorbing all the energies of a great part of the population. That is why this tremendous problem presents itself to us at the very same time when we should be justified in feeling ourselves elated by triumph because of our victories in Parliament. And let not England rejoice too much at our dilemma. If we are doomed to die, she will die with us. For before disappearing, we shall prove to be a great destructive force. And out of the ruins of the British power, we shall raise such a monument that future generations will know what it costs to murder a nation. But if possible, we must live and let live. The elements of reconstruction are always at hand, 
Anglo-Irish culture is indeed dead, but Gaelic culture is only seriously sick. And on that side, there is always room for hope. Sooth to say, its sickness consists above all in the fact that the Irish language is no longer spoken in a great part of the country. But on the other hand, where it is preserved, that same language is spoken in all its purity. By going there to find it, all Ireland will gradually become Gaelic. But it will be objected. What a loss of time and energy. If it is a question of languages, why not learn one of the more useful ones? To this we may reply that while English deforms the mouth and makes it incapable of pronouncing any language which is not spoken from the tip of the lips, Gaelic on the contrary so exercises the organs of speech that it renders easy the acquisition and the practice of most European idioms. Let us add, by way of example, that French, which is usually difficult for strangers, is much more within the compass of Irishmen who speak Irish, no less because of certain linguistic customs than from the original relationship between the two languages. This remark brings us to another objection which is often lodged against our movement. It is urged that Ireland is already isolated enough and that by making a Gaelic-speaking nation, we shall make that state of affairs still worse. English, say the objectors, is spoken more or less everywhere, while Gaelic will never be able to claim the position of a quasi-universal language. To this line of reasoning, it might be answered, for one thing, that no one can tell how far Gaelic will go in case our movement is a success, and that many a language formerly universal is today as dead as a doornail. But we must look at the question from another point of view. John Bull's language is spread everywhere, while he himself retains the most exclusive insularity. He travels to every land and there finds his own language and his own customs. Now, it goes without saying that from this very universalization, his language is corrupted and becomes vulgarized. The idiom of Shakespeare and Milton gives place gradually to the idiom of the seaports. Furthermore, far from isolating us, Gaelic will tend to put us in touch with the civilization of the West. As a people, anglicized and badly anglicized at that, we share and even exaggerate the faults which I have just described. It is Anglo-Saxon speech which isolates us, and we wish on this ground to break with it and to hold out our hand to our brothers of the continent. But it may be said, what a pity to dig yet another abyss between Ireland and Great Britain, for it is with the latter that our geographical position will always link us for common defense. For while it is true that history does not show us a single case of an empire which has not sooner or later fallen to pieces, nevertheless, whatever happens, the two islands will be necessarily forced to cooperate for the common good. Well, let us take it that many things will so fall out, and let us suppose an anglicized Ireland called upon to face such a situation. It would be a revolutionary island, a restless island, an island seeking vaguely for revenge on someone, deprived of really national character, and in a general way suspecting England of responsibility for the disappearance from our country of everything that constitutes the idea of nationality. And let us remark that we are no longer living in those good old times when entire nations allowed themselves to be absorbed by the conquerors. The art of printing has changed all that. Today, a suppressed nation is one that will sooner or later have its revenge. Thus, let us suppose that we are destined to make political peace with England and to enter of our own accord into a Hiberno-Britannic confederation. From our point of view, what would be the result of that arrangement? The result would be strange. Here again, as in the case of Home Rule, it is rather we who offer advantages to England than she who offers them to us. Only in this latter case, the result depends on ourselves alone. If we die, it will be because we have wished it. Our language is not dead. On the contrary, 
although not widely spread, it is in itself much more alive than English, which, as a literary language, is in full decay. We may congratulate ourselves that our idiom is intact. Our civilization is old, but it has not yet lived its full life. If we wish, the future is ours, and let us truly believe that that is worthwhile, for the race which has produced epics like that of Ossian and all that magnificent literature which has been preserved for us through the ages, the race that gave to Europe that great impulse of missionary activity which is associated with the names of Columkill, Brendan, Columbanus, and Gaul, not to mention men like the famous Scotus Erigena. That race is certainly called upon to play an important part in the modern world. But, let us repeat it, it must have the wish. End of section 19. Recording by James McAndrew, San Francisco, California. Section 20 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 20. Famous Irish Societies by John O'Day, National Historian, AOH. In the social organization of no nation of antiquity were societies of greater influence than in pagan Ireland. During many centuries these societies, composed of the bards, olavs, braons, druids, and knights, contended for precedence. In no country did the literary societies display greater vigor and exercise a more beneficent power than in pagan Ireland. Although the Hebrews and other Asiatic nations had societies organized from among the professions, Yet in Ireland alone, these societies seem to have been constructed with a patriotic purpose, and in Ireland alone, they seem to have had ceremonies of initiation, with constitutions and laws. These societies existed from the earliest times until after the coming of St. Patrick. Traces of them are visible during all the centuries from the conversion of Ireland down to the Anglo-Norman epoch, and it is apparent that the clan system and the introduction of the feudal system by the English failed to eliminate completely their influence. When the Irish emigration flowed towards the American colonies in the 18th century, the social instinct early found expression in societies. One of the earliest of these was founded in Boston, where, in 1737, 26, quote, gentlemen merchants and others, natives of Ireland or of Irish extraction, unquote, organized the Charitable Irish Society. In Pennsylvania, where the Irish emigration had been larger than in any other colony, the Hibernian Fire Company was organized in 1751. The Friendly Sons of St. Patrick was founded in Philadelphia in 1771, and about that time societies bearing this name were founded in Boston and New York, as convivial clubs welcoming Irish immigrants to their festive boards. These societies were formed upon the model of the Friendly Brothers of St. Patrick, which had existed in Dublin and other Irish cities a generation before, and was well and favorably known throughout Ireland. The Society of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick in Philadelphia contained some of the most prominent merchants and leading citizens of the city, and in 1780 they subscribed 103,000 pounds, or one-third of the sum collected, to supply the Continental Army with food. Among its members were Commodore Barry, the father of the American Navy, General Stephen Moylan, General Anthony Wayne, and the great merchants Blair McClenahan, Thomas Fitzsimmons, and Robert Morris. Washington, who was an honorary member, described it, quote, as a society distinguished for the firm adherence of its members to the glorious cause in which we are embarked, unquote. Whether upon the field or upon the sea, in council or in the sacrifice of their wealth, their names are foremost in the crisis of the revolution. The Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants from Ireland was founded in Philadelphia on March 3, 1790. Other Hibernian societies, with the same title and organized for the same purpose, were founded in other cities along the Atlantic coast in the early years of the 19th century. But the Philadelphia Hibernian Society was, from the character of its members, the extent of its beneficence, and the length of its existence, the most famous. The emigrants from Ireland during the 18th century had pushed on to the frontier, 
or in some instances remained in the cities and engaged successfully in mercantile pursuits. The emigration which came after the revolution was, however, in great part composed of families almost without means. Unable to subsist while clearing farms in the virgin forest, thousands were congested in the cities. The Hibernian Society extended a ready and strong hand to these helpless people, and not only aided the emigrants with gifts of money, but also secured for them employment, disseminated among them useful information, and provided them with medical attendance. While the Hibernian Society was regarded as the successor of the friendly Sons of St. Patrick, yet the two societies, which contained largely a membership role bearing the same names, flourished in the work of patriotism side by side. The first officers of the Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants from Ireland were President, Chief Justice Thomas McCain, Vice President, General Walter Stewart, Secretary Matthew Carey, the historian, Treasurer John Taylor. It was said that no other society in America contained so many men distinguished in civil, military, and official life as the Hibernian Society. In almost every city where the friendly sons of St. Patrick and the Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants were found, there was a close and intimate connection between them, which ultimately resulted in amalgamation. The ancient order of Hibernians traces its origin to those orders which flourished in pagan Ireland, and which exercised so potent an influence upon the history of the Celtic race. The Order of Knighthood was the first of these orders to be founded. It existed from the earliest times and is visible in the annals of the nation until the Anglo-Normans invaded the land in the 12th century. In pagan Ireland, the knightly orders became provincial standing armies, and there are many glorious pages describing the feats of the Clanadea of Munster, the Clanamorna of Connacht, the Feeney of Linster, and the Knights of the Red Branch of Ulster. When the island was Christianized, these knightly orders were among the staunchest supporters of the missionary priests, and were consecrated to the service of the church in the 6th century, assuming the cross as their distinctive emblem and becoming the defenders of religion. Among the names which are upon the rolls of the ancient orders of knighthood are those of most of the kings, bards, saints, and statesmen, and in the long list there was no family of greater renown than that of Roderick the Great, to which belonged Connell Kernach and Logod, who, according to McGagan and others, were the direct ancestors of the O'Moores of Leeks. In this family, the ancient splendor of the knightly orders was a tradition which survived for centuries, and they were an almost continual rebellion against the English, from the siege of Dublin by Roderick O'Connor until the rebellion against Queen Elizabeth, led by Rory Ogwe O'More and his son Owen in the latter part of the 16th and the early 17th century. A nephew of Rory Ogwe, the sagacious and statesmanlike Rory O'More, revived the ancient orders in the Catholic Confederation of Kilkenny in 1642. A grandson of Rory O'More, Patrick Sarsfield, Earl of Lucan, was the most distinguished commander of Irish armies who opposed in Ireland the forces of William of Orange. There's no stranger story in all history than the intimate connection of the O'More family with the annals of the ancient order of Hibernians. The lineage of this family furnishes the links connecting the ancient orders of pagan Ireland through the centuries with the ancient order in modern times. Under the names of Rapparees, White Boys, Defenders, Ribbon Men, etc., the Confederation of Kilkenny was carried on through the 17th and 18th centuries until the 19th. At various times, the duties of these organizations were subject to local conditions. Thus, the Defenders were occupied in protecting themselves and their priests against the hostility of the penal laws, engaging in armed conflict with the Orange Men in the North, while the white boys were waging war against the atrocities of landlordism in the South. Between these two organizations there was a secret code, which operated until they were combined under the name of ribbon men in the early 19th century. The contentions of the white boys regarding Irish landlordism have since been acknowledged to be just, and have been enacted into statutes. The defenders joined with Wolf Tone in the formation of the United Irishmen. About 1825, the Ribbon Men changed their name to St. Patrick's Fraternal Society, and branches were established in England and Scotland under the name of the Hibernian Funeral Society. In 1836, a charter was received by members in New York City and in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. The headquarters were for some years in Pennsylvania, but in 1851, a charter was granted to the New York divisions under the name of the Ancient Order of Hibernians. New York thus became the American headquarters. 
National conventions were held there until 1878, since which year they have been held in many other cities biennially. Many of the most distinguished leaders of the Irish race in America have been members of the order, and from a humble beginning, with a few emigrants gathered together in a strange land, the membership has grown to nearly 200,000. General Thomas Francis Marr, Colonel Michael Doheny, General Michael Corcoran, and Colonel John O'Mahony were among the members in the late 50s. Among the organizations which have sprung from the ranks of the AOH were the powerful Fenian Brotherhood, the Emmett Monument Association, and scores of smaller associations in all sections of the United States and Canada. During the Know-Nothing riots, the order furnished armed defenders for the Catholic churches in New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston, and it has ever been foremost in preserving its position as the hereditary defender of the faith. In 1894, the Ladies' Auxiliary was founded, and this body of women numbered in 1914 over 63,000, and had donated great sums to charity, education, and religion. The AOH had, in 1914, assets of $2,230,000. It pays annually for charity, sick and death benefits and maintenance over $1 million, and during its existence in America has donated nearly $20 million to works of beneficence. One of the most celebrated of the gifts of the order was the endowment of the Chair of Celtic in the Catholic University of America and one of its greatest gifts to charity was its contribution of $40,000 to the sufferers from the San Francisco earthquake. The Clan na Gael is a society organized to secure the independence of Ireland by armed revolution. Its organization is secret, and it is the successor of the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood, called in America the Fenian Brotherhood, which promoted many daring raids and risings in Ireland in 1867. The IRB was perfected by James Stevens in Ireland and by John O'Mahony in America from 1857 to 1867. An invasion of Canada was made in great force under the general direction of Colonel William R. Roberts, president of the Fenian Brotherhood, but was unsuccessful owing to the attitude of the United States government, which declared that the Fenians were violating the principles of neutrality. After the disorganization of the Fenian Brotherhood, the idea of revolution languished until revived by the founding of the Clan Nagel by Jerome J. Collins in 1869, and the membership during the 20 years from 1880 to 1900 included almost 50,000 of the flower of the men of Irish blood in America. The principle of revolution was first given organized public expression in America through the formation in 1848 of the Irish Republican Union, which was succeeded by the Emmett Monument Association, these societies influencing the creation of the 69th and 75th Regiments of the New York State Militia, and the 9th Massachusetts, which became so famous for valor during the Civil War. Although not putting forth all its strength so as to allow full scope to the parliamentary efforts to ameliorate the state of the Irish people, the Clan na Gael is as vigorous a section as ever of the forces organized for the service of patriotism. The Land League, founded in Ireland in 1879, was transplanted to America in 1880, when the first branch was established in New York City through the efforts of Patrick Ford, John Boyle O'Reilly, John Devoy, and others. Michael Davitt soon after came to America and traveled through the country founding branches of the League. In a few years, the whole American continent was organized, and in this organization, Michael Davitt declared that the members of the ancient order of Hibernians and the Clan na Gael were everywhere foremost. To the enormous sums collected by the League in this country, and to the magnificent labors of Parnell, Davitt, Redmond, Ferguson, Dillon, Kettle, Webb, and others in Ireland, is due in a large measure the present improved state of the people, resulting from the sacrifices made by those who supported this greatest of leagues devoted to the amelioration of unbearable economic conditions. A ladies' auxiliary to the Land League was established by the Sisters of Parnell and was for some years a brilliant vindication of the power and justice of feminine participation in public questions. The Land League, the name of which was changed to the Irish National League in the early 80s, having prepared the path to eventual victory, declined in potency after the political movement was divided into Parnellites and anti-Parnellites in 1890. The elements composing these rival parties were, through the initiative of William O'Brien, M.P., and in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the United Irishmen of Wolf Tones Day, 
joined in 1898 under the name of the United Irish League, John E. Redmond becoming the first president, and also the chairman of the Parliamentary Party, which it had been instrumental in uniting. This organization is now a living, vital force in the affairs of Ireland on both sides of the Atlantic, Mr. Redmond being still its head, with Michael J. Ryan of Philadelphia as president of the American branch. The Knights of Columbus were organized in 1881 by Reverend Michael McGivney in New Haven, Connecticut, and a charter was granted by the Connecticut legislature on March 29, 1882. At first, the activity of the organization was confined to Connecticut, but the time was ripe for its mission, and it soon spread rapidly throughout New England. In 1896, it began to attract the attention of Catholic young men in other parts of the nation, and during the next few years, its appeal was made irresistibly in almost every state. It now exists in all the states of the Union, the Dominion of Canada, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Panama, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Cuba, and the Philippine Islands, with a total membership of 328,000, of whom 108,000 are insurance members and 220,000 associate members. Its mortuary reserve fund is $4,500,000, being over $1 million more than is required by law. It is one of the most successful fraternal societies ever organized, and the Irish American Catholics have given to it the full strength of their enthusiasm and purpose. The temperance movement among Catholics was, from the visit of Father Matthew in 1849, largely Irish. The societies first formed were united by no bond until 1871, when the Connecticut societies formed a state union. Other states formed unions, and a national convention in Baltimore in 1872 created a national union. In 1878, there were 90,000 priests, laymen, women, and children in the Catholic Total Abstinence Benevolent Union. In 1883, the union was introduced into Canada, and in 1895, there were 150,000 members on the American continent. From the CTABU were formed the Knights of Father Matthew, a total abstinence and semi-military body, first instituted in St. Louis in 1872. The Catholic Knights of America, with a membership chiefly Irish-American, were organized in Memphis, Tennessee in 1877, and the advantages offered for insurance soon attracted 20,000 members. The decade of the 70s was prolific of Irish-Catholic associations. The Catholic Benevolent Legion was founded in 1873, shortly followed by the Catholic Mutual Benevolent Association, the Catholic Order of Foresters, which started in Massachusetts and spread to other states, the Irish Catholic Benevolent Union, and the Society of the Holy Name, which latter, although tracing its origin to Lisbon in 1432, is yet dominantly Irish in America. In the large industrial centers, there are scores of Irish county and other societies composed of Irishmen and Irish Americans, organized for the service of country and faith, beneficence and education, and all dedicated to the uplifting of humanity and to the progress of civilization. The ancient genius for organization has not been lost. The spirit of brotherhood pulsates strongly in the Irish heart, and through its powerful societies, the race retains its place in the advance of mankind. References John M. Campbell, History of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick and Hibernian Society. McGuire, The Irish in America. McGee, Irish Settlers in America. John O'Day, History of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and Ladies Auxiliary in America. Michael Davitt, The Fall of Feudalism in Ireland. Cashman, Life of Michael Davitt. T.P. O'Connor, The Parnell Movement. Joseph Deneef, Recollections of the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood. Articles in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Report of the Knights of Columbus, 1914. The Tidings, Los Angeles, 7th Annual Edition. End of Section 20. Recording by Colleen McMahon.